you get moving here. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we have uh, again each week to come and especially to think about what you have shared in your word as it relates to uh, the future that Jesus has for us as our king and your king for sure and uh, the opportunity we have to rule and reign alongside him uh, which is again what you've designed us to do and to be and be made in your image. So we ask that you would bless our time this morning and uh, help us to, uh, as always, to walk worthy of our calling. Uh, our calling is pretty tremendous. And uh, may that be always on our mind as we seek to live uh, with eternity in mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, if you didn't get a sheet, you need a sheet? Yeah. Yep, we're in. You got a sheet? I think they're on yeah, there you go. Uh, last week, we, we've just been talking about this, kind of this phrase here. And then we've been focusing on, again, this, this imagery uh, as we've been thinking all the way back, again, about uh, sons of God. And there's, there's different perspectives, right? But there's no doubt that every flavor, every, every side, uh, what we've been looking is, I'll just put it up here again, uh, looking at God's divine counsel, using that terminology, um, going down here, we have humans down here, just not just because we're physical, so this is all the spiritual realm, you want to say it that way, I'm just going to put spiritual, that everybody believes to some degree this phrase sons of God um, whether it's, it's maybe not in Genesis 6 some people take a different view of the sons of God in Genesis 6 we've gone through all that but certainly in the book of Job uh, Job 38 uh, 6 and 7 and then Job 1 6 and 2 1 that the phrase there clearly is in reference to angelic type beings, okay? Not humans, okay? That's guaranteed. I don't know, if somebody denies that, well, whatever. They can go become Mormon or something, you know, because it's hard to, it's hard to deny what that is saying. Uh, Genesis 6, uh, people disagree on that, and I'm, I'm a little bit more, uh, in my mind, understanding of the differences. Um, but nevertheless, what we do know is this phrase, sons of God, Psalm 89, another passage, Psalm 82, we talked about the last time. The, you have this idea of God inviting this group of people to partake of his administration. And that shouldn't be that shocking. Uh, we, it was, we've said um, as well that the term watchers, we, we, we've gone through all this, okay? especially Daniel 4, all right there, uh, the term watchers appears a lot in the book of Enoch. We've gone through that. But even if we remove the book of Enoch from it, it appears in Daniel chapter 4 as it relates to these watcher, good watchers, these are good guys, um, giving out decrees. Now, people who give decrees, by definition, are what? Rulers. Rulers. So, now granted, they're not ruling outside of God's providence or God's control. And there's no doubt they're not... Uh, they're not renegades, even though some of them, uh, there are fallen watchers, there are fallen sons of God, there are fallen angels, however you want to phrase. So we don't want to redo all that. But what we're focusing on is the imagery that you see in Scripture about this term sons. And what we saw last time was just number one here, or the first page, we won't go through all of it, just that the son, this idea of a son uh, of God, is something that is uh, unique, something that is uh, supernatural, if you want to say the Son. But, let me go back, just step back for a second. Is the idea of a Son of God, I'll put that over here, a Son of God in the Old Testament, is this unique? No. Because we do, there's our some verses, right? And, and, and so you have... This idea of being a son of God, what we do know from this is that these are spiritual beings, okay? And what we've been saying is, what's the, what's the word that we've been using for spiritual beings? Elohim, Elohim right? 
So Elohim is just a Hebrew word that means spiritual being. And Elohim in the Old Testament can refer to any spiritual being, including God, Yahweh. And it, and it does often. Most of the time it refers to Yahweh as being the uncreated creator. But there are many Elohim. That's why this is the hard part. See, when we translate this into English, unfortunately, we say, uh, well, there are many gods. And, we, and, and that, that ruffles our feathers. And that's why I'm for, it, it, it's a bad... It's an accurate rendering, but it's unfortunate because we get nervous about that because we don't want to be polytheistic. But if we say, oh no, there are many spiritual beings, no one has a problem with that. The, the hair doesn't get all up, you know, hackled. So I prefer spiritual being. Yahweh's a spiritual being. Michael's a spiritual being. The watchers are a spiritual being. There's angels. The cherubim are spiritual beings, right? So we, we don't have any problem with that. We will all acknowledge this. It's just when we just, if we use this, even a little G, we start getting, we start getting nervous, okay? And there's no reason to be nervous when we look at the Hebrew. And that, that's what we've been talking through the whole time is to be thinking in Hebrew imagery or Hebrew nuances, not English. So there's no reason to be upset. But what we did see last time is that God had allowed this imagery, especially with being a son or sons, to be all through the Old Testament. And, it, and it, set a, it set a precedent for understanding. Uh, so that when Jesus comes along, and what we said, it, John 3, 16, um, that Jesus described himself, the, the King James, and I would say this uh, is unfortunate, um, describes as only begotten, all right? And what we, dis what we said last time is that they did the best they could for, I'd be curious what the Gideon translation is on this, John 3, 16, honestly. Is it only begotten? There is no such thing as a Gideon translation. Okay. But we, we uh, have the King James Version and English Standard oh. Version. Okay. Oh, oh, you have ESV, though. I see you better. Okay, that's good. So... When you, when you think here, what we, what we described last time was that this is from, this was not wrong at the time that they translated this, the King James in 1611, because that's all they had. That's all the manuscript evidence they have. But now we have so much more, thousands and thousands. And so understanding this, this was a specific verb that they assumed was the root. Now, monogenes is this idea of unique. There you go. Is that really a big difference? Um, it is a big difference. Jesus comes along and says, for God's little world, that he gave his one and only unique son. Which, if you're a Jew, you're going to go, oh, well, we know about sons, because I can read the book of Job or Psalm 82. What do you mean he's the unique son? See, immediately they're going to start thinking about this idea of how is he unique? Um... Was Jesus a, we talked about this last time too, as well as um, Jesus being his physical name, right? Where prior to his incarnation, he was called, as we call, the Son. And we kind of gave some illustrations here. So the question would be, um, like Proverbs 30, what's his name or what's his son's name? You go, oh, this is going way back. And this is only Yahweh here that can gather the wind in his fist and establish the name of the earth. So we have this idea of, of uniqueness, and for them, they're going to go, again, how is he unique? Now for us, and what we said last time was looking backwards from post-New Testament, looking back into, into the Old Testament, how is Jesus, well, here's the question I'll ask you guys, how is Jesus unique as, as a son? We wanted to say it that way. He's Messiah. Okay. Okay, so Messiah, what, what, is, what do you mean by that? Um, I'm not disagreeing, just mm -hmm. well, I guess the, the only one that was able to take on and save through the okay. propitiation, like the, the taking on of the sins of the world. Okay. Um, nobody, no other spiritual being. Could he was born of a virgin. Yes, that's super important because it, it is hypothetically, hypothetically, just bear with me, could Michael the archangel have come down and died on a cross? I mean, 
he could have taken on physical form and maybe been killed or whatever, I, I suppose. But what would have been the problem? Could Michael have been, uh, pardon our Jehovah's Witness friends, could Michael have been Messianic? No. Why? He wasn't human. He wasn't human. See, that's the key. Mm. Taking on the virgin birth, he had to be human because that's the whole point of, of Hebrews chapter 2, that God doesn't give aid, salvation aid, to angels. But he gives it to humanity. Therefore, the Messiah, the Son now, a spiritual being, these are all, I hate to use it, but it's just simplistic. These are all angels up here, okay? These sons of God, we'll put that like that. So what makes Jesus as a son of God unique? Well, he's the Messiah figure. Okay? Rose from the dead. Rose from the dead, for sure. We have the, the third day resurrection. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, he was God and man. Yes! God and man. God. He was eternal. That's way different than these guys, right? So these guys became or were created as sons of God, right? Part of his council. When he created the angels, which according to Job 38, they existed prior to the creation of the foundation of the earth. The foundation, you know, laid the earth. They were there clapping and rejoicing. <coughs> what makes Jesus unique is he is Micah 5 too, right? Bethlehem, his, his, where is his going forth have been? From eternity, from ages past. So he has, he's very, very unique. Um, not only being eternal, but becoming, not just taking on a physical uh, manifestation in the sense of what we might see. He took on humanity. Permanently. That's the incarnation, is huge. Um, we, we, we talked about uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we talked in, in Old Testament times, the Son, most likely, was, this wasn't Jesus, right? Because Jesus was post-incarnation. Okay? The Son most likely came down and was the angel of the Lord. We, we saw that because of their equality there of, of language. Additionally, um, I'm trying to think of how to exactly say it. So, when he came as the angel of the Lord, that was, he's a spiritual being. These are all spiritual beings until New Testament times when Jesus alone becomes incarnate or takes on flesh. Okay? So, if he shows up in a physical, what appears physical, we know that it's not incarnation <clears throat> physical, right? So, Jesus comes and he takes on, that's what makes him unique as well, is that he takes this on, and when he appeared in the Old Testament, he was spiritual, he was a spiritual being, an Elohim, that came and just manifested himself in a physical way. And you know, again, you see this in Genesis 18 when the Lord shows up with the two angels, they're getting ready to judge Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham says, hey, let's have some, let's have some food. And he says, okay, I'll bring out your food. And, uh, but... We know that, was that when God shows up with the two angel escort, who was it? Was it the Father? He's spirit. Well, so was Jesus. Or, see, I messed up. So was the Son. He's spirit, and so is the Holy Spirit. So which one of them showed up there in physical form? Jesus. We don't know. Right? Can we know for sure? It's a good, I think based on our, our uh, New Testament theology looking backwards, we can go, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll bet on 99.9% .9 that it was the sun showing up in all the physical manifestations there. You know, these theophanies or what they call Christophanies. Um, uh, and see, that's even kind of unfair because Christ is a humanity thing. Wasn't he, um, oh great, there he went. Um, the human form, Jesus, was given, oh, I know, was given the job to do this kind of thing. Therefore, you can assume that it is Jesus that came in, in flesh for that. Well, let, let's just not say Jesus, let's say son, okay? Son. Yeah. I'm sorry, just we're going we're gonna to yeah. hold on to that. Um, yeah, that was his job. Therefore, he was sent out before he became human to do this. So, 
Remember John 8, 58? Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it. Before Abraham was, yeah. I am. Yeah. When did Abraham see the son's day? <laughs> oh, okay. Is it possible for us to think that because he is the spirit, he can take on physical form any time? Sure, and of course. Yeah. Time, God's not back limited. Back yeah. So he can do both, right, back and forth. Yes. And then when he can walk on the road and dance. No, no. Hold on a minute. We, we want to say, what we, theologically, theologians, there's a difference between God, what, what, pick one, doesn't matter, showing up in what we perceive as physical form in the Old Testament that is not the same as the Incarnation. Mm. Not. The Incarnation is permanent. So, Let's say it was the Father showing up in physical form. Does that commit him to taking on physical form forever? Does that change his nature? No. But when the Son takes on physical form, he takes it on, he, he, he takes on an additional nature permanently forever. How come he disappeared and wrote in Baez and recognized him and then he said that this he disappeared? So you're saying that he couldn't disappear be being physical? What do you, what do you mean? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It seems like in the oh. same day you said it. Just, just because Jesus, or gosh, just because the Son <laughs> took on additional nature doesn't mean he's limited. Remember because he's that, old. He's still deity. But then he was in his glorified body. He was in his glorified body, which we, he could be, he still is physical, but Physical, in our understanding of physics, is there's a lot of dimensions, right? You know, 10, 11 dimensions. dimensions. So he could do a lot of things, and that he could go through the wall, and he's like, what's the big deal? I'm many-dimensional. That three-dimension stuff doesn't bother me. And will that be our case when we get our new glorified bodies, which will be like his, right? Philippians 3 says that. Maybe. We don't know. What we're saying, though, is just because the Son, God the Son, took on incarnation doesn't make him limited in any way at all. Okay, that would be a kind of a, a denial of deity to be limited in that regard. Although he had human nature. He took on human nature permanently. That's why 1 Timothy 2, 5 says there's one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. That was way later, post-resurrection. He's still human. And that's the beauty of God's commitment to humanity is by giving of his, the one and unique son to becoming human forever. Not just for a would, short period of time. Would um, the fact, I mean, since of the discussion about the Father, i.e. God, I mean, the fact the Bible says no man has seen God at any time. That yes. That kind of maybe get you more... I was going to go there because no one has seen God at any time. And I think when Jesus is saying that, he's not referring to himself. He's referring to the Father. Mm -hmm. So if no man has seen the Father at any time, then again logically or deductively, we would say, oh, so what was Moses seeing and the elders of Israel in Exodus, you know, 24, when they go up to the, and they see, it says, we saw God and we saw a glassy sea under his feet. Based on that passage, I would say, who are they seeing? The sun. It's interesting too, there's another passage in John 12 where if you chase it down, um, J uh, John is writing about Isaiah chapter 6. Behold, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, exalted on his throne, right? And, Isaiah, and his train filled the temple. And in John chapter 12, John is writing and says, he connects both Isaiah 6 and later, and he says, when they saw him, they, he's basically saying that when Isaiah saw the Lord, Yahweh, high and lifted up. In John 12, it's referring to Jesus. Or the Son. The Son. And when you look at you go, whoa, whoa, do, do pronouns matter? Yes. When they saw that, it was referring to him. And now he can write, that really was the Son that they saw high and lifted up. Because in the New Testament, it always says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Well, true. I mean, but remember, it's not a... Uh, there was a vision there that was, there was some vision that he saw of some sort of manifestation of the Lord with his train and sitting on the throne. 
and you see that, you know, especially even the book of Revelation, the ones sitting on the throne, rainbows, you know, <laughs> other things. So when, when we come to the New Testament and Jesus shows up early in John 3 talking to Nicodemus, and he's whipping out this language of God gave his one and only unique son, they're going to go, oh. But what they're going to be thinking of is, oh, if, if they, well, they rejected it. But the default would be, oh, he's one of the Elohim. He's one of these ones. God is sending one of these guys down, one of these spiritual beings down to do, you know, some work. Kind of like the angel of the Lord, right? And, and, and if you study Second Temple Judaism, especially in, in a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls and all, all these other things, they had tremendous theological latitude for understanding these spiritual beings. Uh, there was a book written about 15, 20 years ago called The Two Powers in Heaven. And they understood that there was, they, they had a hard time, the, these Second Temple period Jewish guys, because they were honest with Scripture. And then again, Ju Judaism was very diverse then. After 70 AD and the temple was destroyed, it became very monolithic and rabbinic Judaism. Okay, but very, a lot of diversity. Well, for them, they had this two power idea. Well, what would, two powers in heaven that seemingly seemed equal. Now, why would they have? Why would they think that from the Old Testament? We've already kind of discussed it. You have Yahweh, and then you have the Malach Yahweh, the angel of Yahweh, right? And it's hard to distinguish these two beings. This guy takes credit for leading them out of Egypt. I led you out of Egypt by my power, by my hand. And then in Exodus 3, when the, in the burning bush, Yahweh appears in the burning bush to talk to Moses. And then it says, and the angel of the Lord spoke from the burning bush, saying to Moses, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, and he claims to be the I am that I am there. So it's fascinating that they understood, hmm, what? we don't know how to reconcile this. Well, then later in rabbinic theology, which is the reason that the guy wrote the book, is he was going through and looking at all the, 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 the Jewish writings and saying, this two power idea, okay, these two powers appears in the Talmud and other Jewish writings really from, I would say, third, fourth century on. And they declared this two power idea as a heresy. Now, why do you think that is? One God? Well, sure, certainly. Yeah. Well, after the we're we're talking after the Egyptian after Exodus and whatnot, they're getting into Deuteronomy and all Leviticus. God is very um, adamant about the fact I am I'm the only God. Yes, I yes. Some confusion there. But during the Second Temple period, right, which is let's just say 200 BC to 70 AD. They have to shut the door on Christianity. This is important. There you go. They are reacting, going, man, these Christians are using our own book, our own theology, which used to recognize this. We have to declare this a heresy. It le it shuts the door for there being <laughs> no more two powers. We don't like that anymore. There's only one. Okay, and we talked about that last time a little bit and how. Even later, in 10th century, we, we talked about Maimonides, which is a Jewish scholar, changing the word from echad, meaning composite, right? The two shall become one flesh, Genesis 2.24, to the word yahid, which is the word for absolute oneness, like Islamic theology. Why? To close the door on this idea. And for us, now looking in hindsight from the New Testament, we come and we go, oh yeah, we understand that in the Bible there is a Trinitarian presentation of a Father, of a Son, and of a Holy Spirit being co-equal, co-eternal, co-redemptive, co-creators, all these other things. So they didn't go far enough in our perspective that there's really three powers being co-equal. And again, we can show that. Isaiah 48 is a great example of that. Uh, so, and I could be wrong, but as far as I understand it, they're still waiting for the Messiah in the Jewish. So how... How does that work in if, if they 
say we're still waiting for our Messiah, but there is only one God, how does that? Right here. Human only. Oh, it's a human only Messiah. It's a human only oh. Messiah. Okay. That's, that's, that's as far as the Yep. They definitely, this idea of, they've kind of gone away from this, and a lot of it is, is more about just avoidance than it is uh, talking about it. They just don't want to talk about it. Well, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, and that just is very fascinating mm -hmm. because it opens the door for like so much of what Revelation is talking yes. about to be the seed. The anti-Messiah? The anti-Christ? Yeah. Right. It's really fascinating. So, you know, again, Micah 5 2, you're going for it to have been from old, from everlasting. You know, that's, that's, the, the, even the scribes, remember with Herod, Magi come, Herod, hey, we're coming here to see the king. Oh, what do you mean? Where's he going to be born? He talks to the scribes, they come back and say, oh, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. So they understood Micah 5 2 as being messianic about this, but they didn't, his going for us had been from a long, from old, from eternity. And that's, so, that even. Could that be considered part of the grand rejection? Oh. Prior, I mean, really. Well, we, we also want to be nice. Right. In recognizing that we need to have our eyes open. So again, we're looking 2020 hindsight going, oh, clearly that. No, I'm just talking about the Bible as a whole, the complete story. Mm -hmm. We see that there is a, a repetitive history going on as far as uh, man is concerned. We hit Christ, right? Coming to going, coming and going of the Israelites. This two thousand year gap, yeah, this growth period. But in Revelation, it takes everything back. Mm -hmm. In other words, it picks up at a certain. Point. Oh yeah, it picks right back up. Yeah, I mean the goal of the tribulation is the the primary focus is Israel, right? right exactly. God had kind of he didn't he didn't displace them, but he set them aside and working with that theocracy, depending on your theological persuasion, but. Uh, I'm more dispensational in my understanding of that, that they're there, but 70 weeks are determined, right? Daniel 9, and that right. he's going to come back and re-engage. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Even though it has ramifications for the whole world, it's really the focus right. is Israel. Um, he's going to re-engage with that. So on that first page, what you see here just, we won't do it all, but you have this language of a son, a son, a son, a son, a son. And then in Psalm 82, we talked about the sons. We have sons of God and we have sons of the Most High. And what, what we've been talking about, too, is that what happens in church history is, especially in the interpretation of John 10, which we'll get to, when Jesus is talking to the Jews, and they said, he says, well, I've done a lot of works. Which one are you going to stone me for? They go, well, we're not going to stone you for your works. But you being a man, make yourself out to be an Elohim. See, we, when we read the word God, and I'm not saying that it, he's, this is the thing. So this is why I told you, I'm writing like a dissertation on this, okay? We think in English. The limits of the language would be you being yourself a man, make yourself out to be Elohim. So when we read God, we're thinking, you make yourself out to be Yahweh. Is that really? That could be what they're arguing. It could be. It our, could be. Our English translations say that. No? Exactly. I want you to think English. <laughs> because Jesus isn't even speaking Greek with them. And, and you can show theos in Greek is the same um, in the Old Testament, we, we've talked about all that already. Think with me for a second. Jesus is talking to them, which work. They go, no, no, you being a man, make yourself out to be one of these Elohim. A spiritual being, part of the divine council. That's at least minimum of what the conversation is about. You follow me? And so he's like, well, no, 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 no. That's not enough. That's not enough. I'm not just one of... And that's why he quotes Psalm 82. Hey, in your scripture, it says, you know, hey, there's... Right here. You are gods. You are Elohim. Sons of the Most High. All of you. 
And Jesus quotes this. And we'll get, we'll get more of that later. Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I'm not just an Elohim. I'm this one. I already told you that. John 10 is farther along later than John 3, right? Okay, John 10 is more towards the end of his ministry. But we also have the chronology of Jesus' ministry, but we also have the literary chronology of what John is writing. And John starts right out in John 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, right? And then he goes on to talk about this Word being, create, being creator. So he's throwing out there right at the beginning something about this person prior of being the creator. And we now we know him as the Word or Jesus, right? Okay. And he's saying the Word that I, I'm going to tell you about in the rest of my book, he had some pre-existence. He was there in the beginning. So then when we get to John 3, he's unique. This is unique, Son of God. When we get to John 10, Jesus is like, no, no, man, I'm telling you, I'm not just one of these Elohim. I'm the unique one. And that's why if you write it out in a very uh, parallel way that Jesus is arguing, it's pretty, really, really neat. And he talks about him being um, sanctified and sent. In. Why would the Son, the be sent and sanctified into the world. So, through the works. And so, anyways, we'll, we'll get to that later. I'll analyze it all for you and we'll do it. But, let's, let's go to page two. Because what we want to see is this imagery of the Son of Man. Because uh, in John 10, Jesus says the Son of God, right? That's, that's the Son of God is, is kind of like this idea. His, his pre-existence, which is true. And oftentimes we think of the Son of Man as being, well, that's a reference to his humanity, and I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. And the reason why is the Son of Man has a very unique history in Jewish thinking as well. It has this non-human element, right? Sons of God, these, this Elohim element. But as we, as we get here, you'll see where we're going. Okay, Let's we're going to end up in Daniel 7, as you see on page 2 there. But before we get there, I wanted to just give you a sampling here of this idea of the clouds. Because that's really, really important. Clouds? Well, that's something about clouds. Well, there's, this, there's very consistent imagery about clouds. And again, I'm giving you Exodus 19, uh, Exodus 24. These are early on. I will come to you in a thick cloud. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. So when you think of the cloud... Um, in, in Hebrew, um, we see this, we see this, the, the language, and, and you'll see it, it's, it's actually a Hebrew word. Um, we, 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 we say the word Shekinah, right? Mm -hmm. And we often talk about the Shekinah glory, which really is kind of a double word. You don't even need to say glory, because that's what the word, mm -hmm. this word means. But the Shekinah is always connected with cloud, cloud cloud language, cloud imagery. That's why here, the glory rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it. So now you have glory and cloud right there. Uh, the Lord said to Moses, blah, 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 I will appear in a cloud. First Kings 8, I, I like this one too, when Solomon was dedicating the temple in First Kings 8, 10, the cloud filled the house of the Lord so the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So you have a consistency here now between cloud and glory. In fact, it was so thick, and whatever that means, were they coughing? I don't want to, I don't want to imply that it's like smoke or it, I'm sure it had a visible manifestation. Okay? And that's the idea of this visible God has to, he's spiritual. So he comes in our world and he presents himself in ways that we can perceive. Um, Psalm 104, he walks upon the wings of the wind. Okay, you have this, he makes the clouds his chariot. Isaiah 19, the oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, Yahweh is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. So, in your mind, now, there's an association between cloud, glory, and Yahweh. Unique. I mean, you don't necessarily see these other Elohim 
having this, these kind of titles. These are specifically for Yahweh, right? So fast forward thousands of years of history to Daniel, you know, the book of Daniel. Okay, so Daniel, we're talking like 600 BC, right? He's right around the time they're just about ready to get conquered by uh, Babylon. And Daniel gets these visions. So, and he gets these visions, which is a is probably for us, if we end up going into eschatology after this study, we'll get into it a little bit more. Um, but certainly Daniel 7, Daniel 2, um, Daniel 2, 7 and 8, as well as Revelation 13, talk about these images of these beasts, right? So, you, you have, we'll just do this really, really quick. So you have uh, these four these four beasts, right? Verse 3. Beasts came up out of the sea. The first was a lion. Um, so let's do this here. And it, it's actually in reverse in the book of Revelation. We have lion, bear. What was the other one? What was the third one? Eagle. Well, I think he... Lion? Lion. Yeah, lion. Leopard. 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 Okay. So we have the leopard... Okay, this is going to be Daniel 7. And then we have the, 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 the ferocious beast, all right? He's kind of, that beast is unusual. It's hard to know what kind of animal that was. So in Revelation 13, it describes him in reverse. So, but it's pointing back here, okay? So what do we know? Without getting to, we have lion. Well, let's even go up number five here. Um, because you'll see this... Um, in Daniel 2, we'll remember the story, right? He sees the image of, of, the, uh, of the statue. And what do we have? Gold, silver, bronze, and iron. And then kind of a, kind of a part B here. If you, this is going to be A. Part B is the iron and clay. And then what's the fifth thing that happens in Daniel 2? You have the mountain. You have this... This mountain coming down and a ball and shattering the image of the sh of the of the statue, and it says in the days of these kings, there's going to be an eternal kingdom that's coming. This fifth kingdom, which is we would say Jesus's kingdom. Okay, so remember that imagery. All right. So when we get to Daniel seven, um, he said, let's, I'll ju let's jump into verse 7, Daniel 7, 7 on your sheet. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and mouth speaking great things. Now, we can't get into any of that, sorry. <laughs> As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. So, what are you seeing here? Okay, we're going to keep our, our imagery here for a moment. Let's say that this is a gl glimpse of the throne room. So here we have Yahweh on his throne, and you have other thrones, right? That, that tells you right now that there's divine counsel here. There are many people ruling with God. Not that God needs anybody. He doesn't. But God's very nice. He likes to, he created us to, to share so that he, he, he wants to share in his administration. So you have the big throne, and you have a whole bunch of other thrones. How many? We don't know. Okay. But uh, his throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. That's a reference or would harken back to uh, Daniel's contemporary, which would be Ezekiel chapter 1, right? We have the thrones there, or the wheels. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. Thousand, thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court, okay, the divine council, sat in judgment, and the books were opened. So you have this vision here, and what we've been saying is you have the divine council, or the court, 
Okay? I'll put, I just trust me on this one. I'll put that there. Court. But then you also have these, depending on your translation, some will say attendants. And what we were saying is these are angelic attendants of a lower hierarchy, okay? Servants versus these guys that are on the thrones, okay? He says, I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn, this guy, and as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives are prolonged for a season of time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Th this is where this two-power idea that they have since rejected. They couldn't deny the text in Second Century, uh, Second Temple Judaism. They're like, man, there's this guy, Daniel that comes to the Ancient of Days, we'll just put A of D, but he's coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, there's only one other being that gets that sort of label. Yeah. Clouds are Who's this guy? Okay. Clouds of glory. Right? Clouds of glory, yeah. which only Yahweh gets to have, right? Um, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented. And to him was given dominion and glory in a kingdom that all people's nations language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That's this one here. So here, this fifth one in Daniel, okay, Daniel 2, Daniel 7. Now over here, this fifth one is this um, son of man guy. So we'll see something. Clarification. This is talking about the great white throne judgment? I don't think so. It's not. This is talking about a vision that he had of judgment being cast to remove these Gentile powers mm -hmm. from authority to make room for the mountain or the Son of Man to come into with his kingdom. So this particular vision. I think is a reference to sometime historical. We don't know exactly when, but the great white throne is way, way, way over here, uh, where you have human existence for the most part having already been done. Jesus's kingdom is over in Revelation 20. It's done. So that's that. The great white throne judgment is about eternal judgment for the lake of fire and moving forward for eternity. That's post thousand year reign. This court is in reference specifically to these kingdoms that will be coming. They haven't come yet. So there's a vision based on what we know. What do we know the lion is? Which kingdom? Excuse me, you just said these kingdoms which haven't come yet. When this vision was given in Daniel 7, oh, okay. in, in, 600, in 600, yep, okay. 600 BC, All right. who's the lion? Babylon. Babylon, who's the bear? Persia, Persia Greece. Greece, and then Rome, and then we'll say, if we want to do, scholars will say, part B is revive Rome somehow, whatever that looks like, okay? And then the fourth one is going to be Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Revelation 19, when he returns. So as he's given this vision, the council has made a decision that these guys are coming, but when these guys finish their authority all the way somehow at the end, authority is going to be given to this, this son of man guy. Okay? Which seems to be coming on the clouds, authority, great glory, and you're like, what in the world? Who is this guy coming out of nowhere talking to the Ancient of Days? Okay? Can you clarify that, though, in the son of man, or repeat it, maybe I didn't get it. Son of man versus son of God versus... Son of man is just another title. Uh, son of God. No. I think they certainly apply to the same person. Okay. God the son. But I think son of God primarily 
not only, primarily is in reference to his pre-incarnateness, his eternalness, versus the Son of Man is in reference to certainly some sort of being that has a tremendous level of authority. Where is he coming from? We don't know. Because the only time that the word Son of Man appears, when we, we remember the first page, is these are all Son. Okay? It appears in Psalm 8, which is later. Uh, well, it's actually da uh, David saying that. But we see Son of Man appearing in the book of Ezekiel a lot. But that's, I think, that's speaking to Ezekiel. And I'm, and I'm not saying, in Hebrew, this word Son of, uh, Son of Man certainly can refer to human beings. I'm not saying that it doesn't. But when you throw that language here in Daniel 7, this is just, this is some guy, some guy coming on the cloud of heaven. Um, with tremendous authority. And There's something unique. What See? we would assume he's human. Correct. I, 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 I would say, yeah. I got no problem with that. But he's unique somehow. Oh, yeah. But we don't know. So let's turn to page three. Okay. What you see in the rest of this, well, let's just go. Daniel, I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. Then I desired to know about the fourth beast, which was different and exceedingly terrifying. Uh, he goes on, and the rest of this is really talking about the end of this fourth beast right prior to the Son of Man coming and the mountain coming. How do we know that? Well, in Daniel 2 with the vision of the, um, of, of the statue, it says in the days of these kings, there's going to be this mountain that comes out and annihilates it, which has, has Jesus come back yet? Obviously not. So that's why scholars, they deduce, well, <clears throat> when Jesus returns in the fullness, this has to be here somehow. Rome disappeared in 474 A.D., yeah, at least yeah, Western Rome. There's no words in there, there, part B. That's what I oh, said. There's, there's a part B somehow, which is different because the first one was iron. This one has an iron and clay, and it's right. not as strong as it was back then. So, what, you know, what, you, what do you have here? You have a whole bunch of data. <laughs> and the mind goes, let's try to reconcile this. Not only with... Um, History, which we know, clearly those are fulfilled, and Rome is fulfilled. But how do we look forward? And we know how dangerous it is to look forward, right? We saw a couple weeks ago how God had cloaked um, his plan to some degree so that the angels wouldn't figure it out. But in hindsight, we look back and go, oh, it's crystal clear. Okay, Isaiah 53 and other passages. So those in the future will have compassion on us. We have compassion. Yes, I hope so. Christ to go. Well, we, they tried their best. They tried their best with what I, they had. I don't think we're completely ignorant, but we recognize, hmm, what is, what is this revive Rome? Is that the European Union? You know, it, it's... Are we possibly not living it right now? Not living it? No, are we possibly actually in it right now? I don't think like this. This this final kingdom is is a is a tribulation kingdom, right? It, it appears it appears immediately before Jesus comes back on the mountain. How long does that last? I don't know. Okay, I'm just saying we're we're escalating, right? We're coming into the end. Yeah, we're coming into the end. We no doubt we're in the end of the age. That's why right. Israel's here. I wanted to say a whole bunch of other things. This all takes place yeah. just pre, probably pre last three and a half years. There's no doubt. The middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist is in full power. Right. That is 100%. He takes away the sacrifices, you know, Daniel 9. So you have that there. How far does it extend out before the tribulation begins? Obviously, if the if the Antichrist confirms the covenant with Israel for one week, that's, he has to have some base of power in order to make it worthy, beginning. right? That's the so, beginning of the seven years at that point. Correct, yeah. And because he has not claimed to be God yet, are a lot of Jews going to fall for it, that he's a physical body claiming uh, before he well, claims to be God? He, they're going to receive him as a human messianic 
Savior. So they buy into it. Yes, but then in 2 Thessalonians 2, he goes into the temple, which has been there, and he declares himself to be. And they, wow. that's, woo, they, that's it. And he takes away their sacrifices. So it's very, very consistent. So they'll reject him. As soon They're as going to reject him, and then he turns on them. That's Revelation 12. He goes to seek him. They're, remember we saw they flee into the wilderness for 1,260 days, time, times, half a time, 42 right. months. All super consistent. And, but God protects them because he's, he's got an appointment with these Jews. Two-thirds of them are going to die, according to Zechariah 13. But the one-third that make it through, he has an appointment at the end of the tribulation when they call out to Jesus. Jesus says, you're not going to see me until you say what? Blessed is he who comes, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew 23. That's why I said, if we could just get Netanyahu to, to claim Jesus the Messiah and call him back, man, he's coming back today. <laughs> but they won't get there. They're going to have to be ground down. By Zechariah 13 talks about them being in the refiner's fire. Yeah. And they're going to go, in the tribulation, Jesus says, is great. Nothing like it ever has existed. And you go, what about World War II? Nope, it's going to be worse. And it's fascinating to me when you look at the numbers. You know, in, in, there was 18 million Jews in roughly 1940 worldwide, a third of them were killed, 6 million, okay? Well, now they're back up to about 18 million. And Jesus says, or Zechariah, if, if that's an accurate trans tra interpretation, two-thirds are going to go, mm. which is worse than World War II, which Jesus said, nothing's going to be like it up until that point. Two-thirds, you're going to have 6 million coming out, and those are the ones that are, all Israel will be saved at the end. And you see this in, in Hosea chapter 5 as well, where... You have like the Messiah speaking. He says, I'm going to go and return to my place. Okay, so here he is on earth. He's going to go and return to his place until you acknowledge your offense. Which is consistent with Zechariah. Or um, it, it's consistent with Zechariah 12 where they'll look on me whom they pierced. Matthew 23. So Jesus is up there going, mm, it's a time of Jacob's trouble, the seven years. Why? I got, I got seven more years. I, we're, going to, we're, going to be, we're going to be talking. But the purpose of the tribulation is to grind them down to where they have nothing left except calling on the Messiah that they killed. And once that realization comes, they cry as if they were weeping for their only son. You know, it's very consistent all the way through. You know, when, when, when you think of six million coming through it, okay? Mm -hmm. But when you think of linear time, from the very beginning to the tribulation, the millions of faithful, whether they, they believed in what the prophet said, you know, there are so many more that have made it to heaven because of the linear time thing. That, that you know, we're in pre we're in present time now, for, and we only see it from now. But now, 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 now is always available to those that believed, and so now we're talking millions, if not a billion, souls that are in heaven that that, that did believe. Sure, I think about. John the Baptist, or right. Zacharias, Elizabeth, you know, these guys that were faithful, Malachi, the prophets, whoever. You know. Even those that were faithful during the time periods that they repented. Sure. There's a millions yep. along the way. Yep. My point that I was trying to get to, we constantly talk about hindsight. We see, you know, we have it. We've got the, the trouble, and we see the solution that God presented, and what came from that, and what came from that. And the reason I said that there's a possibility is kind of relative to what James was just talking. Mm -hmm. Linear time versus yep. living out of the box like the spiritual realm does. Yeah. Not just God. But in fact They're still but they're still in time. They're they're still in time. Yeah, they're not outside of time. Only God is outside of time. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. We are the history of being wrote. Yeah. Well, that's why we said last time in first Peter Bible, one twelve, the, the angels are watching it unfold. Right. So we are the history, yeah. in fact. So we can't. Yep. So. Our dependence has to be on the Lord, in fact. <laughs> Absolutely. Because. And, you know. Change as long as these We're the chosen generation. <laughs> How long, you know? We're here at the end of the end. Well, you know, we are the history that was being written. Yeah. For the future. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we saw it begin in, in, you know, after Jesus left. You know, this right. is the last days. There's the last days in the Bible, which is really a reference to. 
Jesus' departure all the way to the end. And then there's the last days of the last days, you know, right. like Jesus in Matthew 24, what's the end of the age? Well, that's a different, there, there's this last age, but there's the end of the age. What are the signs? And he gives us examples of that. What I've highlighted here on page three in red, the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom, verse 18. Verse 22, the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, that, and the time came when the saints, the word holy ones, it possessed the kingdom. And finally in 27, it talks about the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints. So what scholars will recognize here is that the word kedoshim, holy ones, sometimes refers to angels. Sometimes it refers to humans. That, well, the, the 27 is really easy. This is the people. This is us or the, the, the saints that are going to receive the kingdom. So what they're, what they're trying to see here is um, the kingdom that is given to the, the Son of Man, this guy, is also given to humans, but also given to the faithful sons of God, Michael, Gabriel, etc., they're also going to receive, they're going to be part of the kingdom with us. That was the way it was intended in the beginning, right? And, and we screw that up, and now there's been a separation there between what we say the physical here and the spiritual. So uh, this idea that it was judgment was given for the Kedoshim, the, the holy ones, could refer to angels as well. Uh, it certainly refers to us, for sure. And you can see that. So let's, let's keep going, because I want to finish this. So we have the imagery I gave you on page two of clouds in the Old Testament, the sample. Here's, what about the New Testament? This is Matthew 17. This is the transfiguration. While he was still speaking, this is Peter, remember? Peter says, oh, wow, that's great, let's build some tents. Remember, he <laughs> starts talking, he talks too much. While he was still speaking, God interrupts him, no surprise. Uh, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. What you have there is, is what did Peter say? He said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's create some, create some tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because Moses and Elijah have showed up. So now Peter is looking at Jesus as being one of the three. And that didn't, it seems, God's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's not equality here. <clears throat> okay? And what he says, this he, very short phrase, this is my good son, and well, please listen to him. These are all references to Old Testament stories. My beloved son, right? Genesis 22. We went through that phrase by phrase. Mm -hmm. With whom I'm well pleased. Well, who's the pleasing servant? Well, that's Isaiah 42. That's a very messianic phrase. Listen to him. Is Deuteronomy 18, where Moses says, hey, God's going to raise up another prophet like unto me, blah, blah, blah. You need to listen to his words. So right here, you have, you have the son, you have the servant, and you have the prophet, okay? Or the son, the Messiah, and the prophet. Remember when, what they asked John the Baptist? They said, who are you? Yeah, are you the one? They asked him, are you the prophet? Are you the, yeah. are you the Messiah? Who are you? So there's, there's, they asked him, there was this expectation of this figure, you'd have the Messiah and the prophet for sure, at least those two. And he said, no, I'm not, not a little hurry, I'm a voice crying in the wilderness, right? Isaiah 40. But right here, you have a unique, my beloved son, you go back to Genesis 22, your one and only son, that's what God says to Abraham, we saw that. So it harkens back to one whom you love. So you go, oh. Okay, Genesis 22. The one who I'm well pleased, you have this suffering, uh, this pleasing servant, this messianic figure, which of course Isaiah 42, Isaiah 50, Isaiah 53, all of it go together. And then you have the prophet. And God's, God basically says, he's all of them. You need to listen to him. You need to listen to him. He's the prophet, he's, the, he's that messianic figure, and my one and only son, unique, uh, which is pretty fascinating. Matthew 24, Jesus says, the sign of the Son of Man. See, he's using that language. The Son of Man. Immediately the person is going to go, Daniel 7. There's a Son of Man coming on clouds, coming up to Yahweh, and he gets a kingdom. 
Jesus says, And the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Do you think Jesus is using this language just haphazardly? The Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory is a reference to this Daniel 7 guy. And Jesus is saying, I'm that guy. I am the Daniel 7 guy. Luke 17, for just like lightning when it flashes out one part of the sky, shines the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Now here you, here's an interesting thing. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Jesus now is associating himself with the Son of Man, but also with a suffering Isaiah 53 figure. This Son of Man, he's going to receive his power and great glory and kingdom. But, you know, we saw that. But that Son of Man guy is also going to suffer. That is new information that the Jews didn't have because they perceived, in their in the theology even later, you can go way back, remember they had the, the Messiah, the conquering Messiah, and the suffering Messiah. And the conquering Messiah was like the Son of Man guy, or David's final king, Psalm 2, I'll set my king, a conquering, conquering, conquering one. But they were also a little confused because Isaiah 53 talks about this suffering guy. So they had two different guys. The beauty of it is what we see is now just two different comings. Same guy, God the Son, is going to take on humanity. But Jesus is now bringing these things together. Luke 24, was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then enter his glory. So now we have the Son of Man in Matthew 24 coming with power and great glory, but he's also going to suffer before he enters his glory. So Jesus, by taking all these together, he equates the Son of Man with the Messiah who's going to suffer first and then circle back around to get all the glory. And he's going to become in the clouds. I mean, he's, he's taking all this to himself. I like Matthew 26. Here, Jesus is at his um, trial. He's getting accused in verse 61. This man said that I'm able to destroy the temple and rebuild it three days. The high priest stood up and said to him, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Now that's very, very interesting. That it is different than the Son of Man, but we'll see how it's equated. Why would they ask him if he's the Son of God? Jesus, remember, he had already been claiming that other title, not just Son of Man. That's was, this was his favorite title. Well, this is after the uh, being accused of at least being an Elohim. Correct. This is after John yeah. 10. Right there in the same Elohim. week, really, if you, if you do week. it. And, mm -hmm. and he had basically told him, no, I'm greater than that. Do you claim to be and they had to go away and, a bad Elohim? Yeah. Do you claim to be God? one of these? And he says, Jesus said, you have said it yourself, which yeah. is another way to say, yep. Yeah. Nevertheless, I tell you after, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the cloud of heaven. <laughs> oh, God. He's pulling out Daniel 7. You know what you're going to see, Jack? <laughs> you're you're going to see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. That's this word, power. Remember we talked about the two powers in heaven? This is a euphemism that another way to speak that they did in the second temple period of Yahweh being at the right hand of power. The son of man guy was seated at the right hand of power, of, power, of, of Yahweh coming on the clouds of heaven. Wait, the cloud coming on the clouds of heaven, that's only reserved for Yahweh. Because, yep. Matthew 25, 31, this is right before this. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. This is Jesus' return. Who is he coming with? Angels, the Kedoshim, the holy ones. Luke 22, this is another version of, the, of, the, um, of his trial. When it was day, the council of elders 
of the people assembled, both chief priests, scribes, led him away. If you are the Messiah, verse 67, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you won't believe. And if I ask a question, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they all said, are you the Son of God then? So now they're equating the Son of Man with the Son of God. Unique privileges. And what does he say? Yes, I am. Then they said, what further need do we have of testimony? We've heard from his own feet, right then and Boom. Yeah. One of the rare times that Jesus was explicit, saying, I am that guy. You got it right. And he, I think one of the reasons he did it was to was, was true, but secondly, he knew that it would bait them at see the proper time. Right then and there. Because how often in John do we see his hour had, yet, had not yet come? His hour had not yet come. His hour had not yet come. And then finally he says, my hour's here. And here he says it, and they go to kill him. Psalm 110, Psalm of David, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Okay, We, we saw in Matthew 22 where Jesus asks them a question about this passage. Hey, if, you know, who, who's the Messiah? Well, he's David's son. Well, if he's, if he's David's son, how then does he call him Lord? Because you wouldn't call your son Lord. It's, it goes upwards. So there's something about this passage that David calling the Messiah Lord is something more. Yeah. It shows some sort of higher level of humanity or above that, which would be Elohim plus. And they said, we don't know. He said, okay, if you don't know. I kind of got my mind stuck. I'm not trying to get off the track. But, uh, regarding the Son Man, Son of God, a few times we see it here, and then many times we see it there. For some reason, and this is just my own thinking, it keeps taking me back to the garden when we were <coughs> sons of God yes. within the garden. We'll see that on the bottom page there. Right. Mm -hmm. And then after the fall is more when this, in other words, we have Son of Man in Christ who is faithful, perfect, mm -hmm. unique. It's perfect human. Obedient. Yep, He's perfect the son. Per the perfect human. Our representative. And that's mm -hmm. what I see that speaking to when yep. I say that. That we, in fact, were supposed to be. Is that correct? Am I on there? Yes. Okay. And because we blew it, God the Son was part of the plan from the beginning, but God yeah. the Son became human. Why? To bring many sons or many children to glory. That's Hebrews chapter 2, right? Or Hebrews 2 and 3. Exactly. So, the, the, Jesus came and said, my intention for humanity, it got blown. But I'm going to come and become human, and I'm going to win it back. I'm going to defeat the enemy so that I can bring the rest of God's people with me, and we can fulfill our destiny in his shadow. Well, alongside of him. You know, it seems like, you know, I've never looked at this cloud that much, but it seems like every time... The cloud is referenced, and it looks like it's uh, a the God the Father is representing himself in the present form of a, of a form of a cloud because he fills the temple. He comes his glory. It doesn't say guess, himself, but it's his glory. I guess what I'm just saying, it just seems almost like it's synonymous. Like it's, that's how he chooses to represent himself. Because he, remember, he's he, the Father is a spirit, so he's formless. In, in our physical thinking. Well, he passed, passed. That shows, let's say, authentication of yes. the Son. And For sure. The, oh. Authentication of the dedication of the temple is authentication of all that. It shows you power, glory, and authority. That's why, you think about Jesus after Matthew 28, right? He came and he said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. You think, really? What, what about Yahweh? All authority where? Who can claim that? Maybe Yahweh. Only, maybe only this guy. <laughs> maybe Yahweh's getting ready to go on pension. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> okay. I don't know. So let's let's wrap it up here. Okay. Acts one nine. Just as he was going up, a cloud received him out of sight. First Thessalonians four seventeen is a reference to the rapture. We will be caught up together with Jesus in his return, coming to get in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. Revelation 11, 12, this, this is the, the rapture of the two witnesses. Mm -hmm. Then they went up into heaven in the cloud and the, as the enemies watched. I just find it so consistent. 
Um, Revelation 1.7, uh, John gets this image. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Everybody will see him. He's mourning. It's, it's so clear. This is just a sampling. But what, we, what we're doing here is in, at, the, at the bottom, Romans 8, if children are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer, we shall be glorified. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be here with glory that will be revealed into us. For the anxious longing of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Sons of God. I mean, that, that, again, the language, this is, this is loaded language all the way through. We, at the creation itself, will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God or the sons of God. We have glory, too. Of course, it's dependent on God's glory. But we have glory. And uh, that's what we were designed. Again, I just gave you a couple other passages which we've talked about before that Jesus will give us authority over the nations. We'll sit down in his throne. And we will finally fulfill what was our destiny that we blew For the beginning. in the beginning. The beginning. Then we will return to that mm -hmm. after the yep. Yeah. This is kind of going back to the thing of Elohim, but I was just all of a sudden the idea flitted through my brain. You know, the disciples, the apostles, so, never really recognized Christ who he was until really after the resurrection. Is that a, is the possibility because they just saw him as an Elohim? They, they had to be taught the same as the Pharisees. Because they were familiar with that. God. Yeah, they were familiar. Elohim, I think for them, I think part of it is it's hard to know Messiah, are you? With, huh? with Peter, what did Peter say at the, at the right before the transfiguration? You know, who do men say that I am? Well, Jeremiah, this, that, you know, the prophet. He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Is that more, was Peter acknowledging at least as messianic? Was he implying more? It's hard to know whether they believed that he was eternal. How far did the blinders go? It's hard to know. What we do know is later, John can write John 1.1. 1, 1. Oh, clearly, this guy, man. Before Abraham was, I am. They're hearing all these things, and they're going, we don't, what, what did he just say? What did he mean? Before Abraham was, I am. Well, that's kind of God's title. I was the creator. You know, um, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. All these little things that probably confused them. Because he was more than a rabbi. Oh, Oh, probably they, they certainly believed he was the Messiah, but remember at that time they had a very human messianic um, vision. Did they, did they grasp his fullness? I don't think they grasped the fullness of who he was until after the resurrection. It's really hard to know. Did they not also confuse themselves? Well, yeah, several things they go, oh, we didn't. Well, now after the resurrection, we realize what he meant. By, like the temple, I'll destroy this temple in three days. Oh, now we understand he's a reference to his resurrection. You know, they certainly, when he died, right, these guys weren't just counting the days. They had, they had given up. But didn't they have the, they, they had the Old Testament? Three days, I don't know, we, we talked about three days. We did, uh, but they didn't. What, what, were, what drove them not to understand that about the Because the Holy Spirit came in. And illuminated their minds so they understood it. Oh, remember, well, we want to give them right? grace because remember, we looked at all the verses that their eyes were blinded, their eyes were blinded, their eyes were blinded. <laughs> uh, we, how themselves did God just not give them insight, not until the proper time? Well, wasn't this in relationship to the fact that they got it wrong? In the, talk about Second Temple Judaism and everybody was all. I don't want to say all over the page, but well, oh, they were all over the page. Okay, okay. they were say all that. over yeah. the page, and that's what created this yeah. issue. And that what was coming out of it was the you said two messiahs. That's well known. Mm -hmm. And I think the focus was on the first, right? But you had two messiahs. You had the Son of Man guy. You had the Angel of the Lord guy. Then you had another guy, Metatron. You know, which some easy Michael. That they saw all these. It was hard for them to wrap it all together. I don't, I don't fault them. We're looking in hindsight. Amen. To us, what do we do? We put God the Son, or Jesus, right in the middle, and it solves on all. Oh, that's what that means, Jesus. Oh, yeah, Jesus. You throw Jesus right in the middle, and that's why Paul would say that when they read, in 2 Corinthians 3, when they read the Old Testament, they have a veil 
But when you throw the Messiah in there, the veil is lifted. And we have that, looking back. I feel bad for these guys, but oh, why did God do it? He yeah. kept it cryptic. And so he that, didn't want to reveal the secrets no, too fast. Because, because if they would have known, yeah. they would not have killed him, right? Which they used to. But in hindsight, we're looking like, oh, damn. Now we see God's wisdom. What I'm doing is I take all of that, Judaism at the time and everything, and when you look at the Gospels, it says, and when the time was right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so, let's end it here summarizing. This language, the Son of Man, Son of God, he ultimately has to do with a person. God the Son comes down as Jesus, takes on, but it also has to do with the same language as us. Right. And, and that's why it says he'll bring many sons to glory. You know, he's using that language. Jesus' goal was say, hey, I got a plan to redeem these people that Jesus said in John 6, another that the Father gave me as a gift. I need to redeem them, but they're going to come and rule away with me. That, that's where we're going, and the language is all consistent throughout. Okay, well, let's pray. Father, we do thank you that we have the privilege of or taking all these puzzle pieces together and looking backwards and seeing how they fit so beautifully. They've been there the whole time. Uh, again, your glory is shown and manifested truly that it's all there. Um, we thank you for the insight that you give us uh, that we, again, by your Holy Spirit, no doubt, who, who guides us into all truth. And we thank you, Lord, for the destiny that we have. And we thank you for, as Hebrews, the captain and, and the, the, the author of our salvation who has led us into that glory that's coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.